All right, guys, let's get settled. We're going to get going here with our next presenter. So I think as we heard when you talk about the Indian's way, where you're blending the physical, the fundamental, the mental, as we were kind of putting these, the order of these speakers, when you look at what Jimmy just kind of set as foundationally with our fundamentals, and then as we get into each speaker, you'll start to see, okay, they're touching a little different area. And so as we get into Pete, um, you know, we have fundamentally, obviously, what matters most, but then as now we talk about the physical, and you've heard Jimmy say, well, obviously, the, right, the faster we swing the bat, um, right, we're going to get better, we're going to be a better hitter. And so um, Pete Lauritsen, who is our lower level hitting coordinator, what I love about Pete's story is a little different from some of the other guys that you're going to hear. Yes, he played in high school and, and he loved the game, but um, you know, his, his ability didn't take him on the path to play professionally. But as you guys are here, and man, what a great conversation already of knowing you guys, uh, you love hitting and you're digging deep and studying. Um, that's, right, that's as I've gotten to know Pete, that's what Pete is all about, digging into video, right, what matters most. Uh, and, and really being obsessed with it. And so as he got into coaching high school, college, and now pro, I think that's the other great thing that, that Pete offers is very similar to where you guys are at and taking that knowledge as he's learning and learning and then obviously implementing it with his programs because we get this information and, and we don't want to just, right, we want to implement it. We want to give it to our players and our programs. And Pete has had a ton of success at all levels, high school, in junior college, right, taking teams and, and the numbers are, um, I, I know he doesn't like to sit here and, and, and hear this bio, but, um, you know, the guys that he was able to develop, the teams offensively, um, you know, taking them to junior college World Series, uh, and then spending a year at Iowa uh, and doing the same thing. And so um, I know the Indians are pumped to have him um, and, and really overseeing some of the things that they're teaching uh, in developing hitters. And so um, I'm going to pass it on, Pete Lortz, and our lower level hitting coordinator. Thanks, Pete. All right, thank you. First thing I want to say about Jimmy's presentation is that was a firsthand glimpse into the Cleveland Indians coaching room, like in spring training. Like, that was it. Like, those types of conversations. And once you get Jimmy going on that, there is just no stopping that train. The analogy train, the PowerPoint presentation with the mouse traps and the look, like all kinds of stuff. So I also want to say like I'm not a PowerPoint expert, so my PowerPoint's going to suck compared to Jimmy's. And I'm also playing a psychological game there to try to set you up so when I bang it out of the park, it's going to look better than what it did. So a little psychological game there. Uh, what we're going to do though, what I'm just going to talk about is weighted bats. Okay, the, the, the importance of moving faster, swinging faster, why we want to implement that, especially youth ages, high school ages, I have a lot of experience at, at those types of age of kids. Um, the most important, to, to start off by saying that weighted bats in itself is never going to be the answer. Just talking about movement itself is never going to be the answer. It's a holistic view. Movement, a way that you can enhance movement, a way that you can enhance speed is by using weighted bats. Then you go to the pitch recognition side. That's extremely important. If you have all the speed in the world, but you don't know how to use it, it doesn't make a bit of difference. And then you go to Luke's point, if as a coach and player, if you don't know how to communicate it all, well, then it really doesn't matter, okay? So it's a holistic view. I do not want to say any of this stuff and make you think that this is the golden ticket or the answer. It's not. It's just a way to improve upon these things. And the order I want to do it, um, I want to explain to you the program itself in season and off season. I'm going to give you some examples from high school teams that have used this, um, and also in private facility uh, settings, and then I'm going to explain the why and how, and at the end I'll show you some drills on the field, that type of thing, of ways that you can use it. Okay, to start off, and this is as simple as it gets, this is how you make a weighted bat, okay? <clears throat> I don't mean any disrespect to like any weighted bat companies and that type of thing. I think it's the biggest waste of money of all time. It doesn't make any sense to me. The most important part of the weighted bat is the weight on the end or the middle or wherever you put it yourself. So you see in the picture, 
All that is is a roll of athletic tape. A roll of athletic tape is gonna cost three or four bucks. A roll itself is gonna weigh plus or minus three ounces. Okay, and typically on our bats, as you'll see, we never, we never really put more than six or seven ounces. Three to four ounces is about the typical size that we put on. And the one on the right, um, I think is one roll, might be a little more than one roll. The one on the left was two rolls. The one in the middle, we just put the weight in the middle. Our guys use all of them, but the two with the ones on the end is the one that guys use the most. And when you see in the program, when it says overload bat or weighted bat, that's the one it's referring to the most. Okay, so when we talk about this, now the other, the other thing with it, I think one of, the most, the, one of the most difficult things for programs in itself is to find, find systems or programs that are explanatory, repeatable, and predictable. It is one of the most difficult things in hitting to find. It's one of the most difficult things in sports in general. That's why Nick Saban dominates people. That's why Bill Belichick dominates people because they have a system that is repeatable and it's predictable. Okay, so in hitting, how can we do that? This is one area in my experience, and it took a lot of trial and error, that I found that is repeatable, it is predictable, and it could see some sort of sustainability. Again, it's not the only answer, but this is how we found a way to help improve our players. And the other aspect of training for speed, with the movements being important, the weighted bats being a factor, one of the lowest areas of hanging fruit to improve a player's performance is hitting the ball harder. Okay, what is the lowest hanging fruit? Speed, accuracy, control of the strike zone. I feel like in the cages, I can set up an environment, I can set up a training system to work on those things. Speed being itself, I think is the easiest to take a guy, a young kid, a youth player, an eighth or ninth grader. How many guys in here are, what do we got the distribution of youth and high school coaches? Youth coaches, okay, high school coaches, college coaches. Okay, so it's youth and high school, right? So this is, this is the perfect time to do it. Dr. Greg Rose with TPI. I do not have a lot of experience myself implementing this with like fifth and sixth graders. Typically like seventh, eighth grade range is my experience of, of introducing it. Dr. Greg Rose with TPI, Titleist Performance Institute, he came and talked to our guys. He would, he would make the argument in the case that training for speed, the quicker the better. He makes the argument at the age of 22, like it's really difficult to try to do that. I'm not gonna get into it because I haven't researched it a ton, but he talks about how the bones grow faster than the muscles. And as soon as you can to work on speed and intent, which is the most important part of training with weighted bats. It's the intent. Intent itself has a lot of meaning. Intent to swing fast, to do damage, to hit the ball hard, to move fast, to encourage when a sixth or seventh, seventh grade kid takes a swing and yeah, maybe it's not perfectly balanced and they fall over a little bit, encourage it. Yes, do it again, do it again. As opposed to the opposite, if you put them in handcuffs and shackles and you strip away any type of movement and now they start becoming slow and timid, you are gonna slow their bat down and you are taking away an area that they need to work on to improve, okay? Um, Okay, so again, intent being the most important aspect to start with it. The second thing, okay, so you can take your regular bat, forget the weighted bats, you don't, even need to, you don't even need to use them. This is a dirty little secret in my little weighted bat program. You don't need it. You could take your regular bat and as long as you have an intent mindset, you can improve your bat speed. The dramatic increases that I can show you are to make even more improvement on hitting the ball harder it comes when you use the weighted bat. Um, the weight on the end, why I like the weight on the end, it's a the farthest thing away from your hands, the farthest thing away from your body. You have to recruit the right muscles to really control this then. Think of your high school kids in general. What are some flaws? You talk about the bat and the bat path and the movements of your body. What could happen? If I, maybe I do all my loading right, my rear hip, my rear scap, 
but the weight on the end could cause me to lose this thing if I, now I don't turn and rotate the correct way. So it is trying to enhance that movement. I would say with that, there's no magical thing like, just do this and now your movements are just gonna automatically improve. It's not that simple, I wish that it was. You have to keep an eye on it as a coach to make sure that it is uh, in the right movement pattern. Okay, and then it's also important when you're doing this that we understand we wanna take all this increased speed, all the increased ability to hit the ball harder, we want to do it in different timing windows. I, we don't test on a tee or anything like that. We do our testing in front toss, I'll explain that type of stuff, but we also wanna see it maintained off of throwing harder, scooting back the BP and throwing a little bit harder, ultimately hitting off of a machine, ultimately to get into a game against doing it against a real pitcher. It really does not make a difference if I improve my bat speed and hit the ball harder, if I'm just doing it in front toss and end of the game, I'm not getting those kind of swings off. Everything we're trying to do is to transfer onto the field. Okay, and then with the attack angles, you saw Aaron Judge there. He was a ground ball machine and he's a 6'6 monster, okay? If you hit the ball really hard like that but you have bad attack angles, you're just out faster. Like you are literally just hitting the ball to the shortstop faster and now you're out by six steps instead of three or four, right? So if I have to produce the right angles to hit the hit good line drives, okay? And I'll, I'll kind of show one of the areas we try to work on to do that. The very bottom, the only reason I put this on there because well, I think one of the biggest myths is when you're facing a guy throwing harder, you're getting into the high school playoffs and you're facing a guy throwing 86, 87 and the idea, because I was always told this as a high school player, the idea, he's throwing hard, so you just stick your bat out there and the ball's gonna go. Eh, probably not, okay? The truth is 85% of exit velocity is produced by the hitter, 15% by the speed of the pitch. So that is a lot that the hitter is in charge of. I am in charge of moving the correct way to create speed to hit the ball hard. Okay, so the program itself, and I'll get into this, but this is what it's called. It, we call it the Swing Faster program. The reason I'm showing you this is because I think it's applicable to your age levels, okay? And I think that's important. A lot of the times you see some of this stuff and it's like, oh, all the pro guys are good. Yeah, but we don't work with pro guys. We don't work with that type of talent, so we can't do that type of stuff, okay? The junior college guys that we had are very similar to the players that you had, okay? So what we did, again, 2010, 11, 12, there's a lot of trial and error with weighted bats different weights, I never really had a really good system with it. It was just a lot of playing around, and I did a lot of lessons on my own, and it ultimately turned into a system that we created, and this is the first year we implemented it. Okay, so from 2013 to 16, in our off-season program, in the eight-week fall period, we would hit two or three times a week in groups of two or three. Okay, and the sessions would range, they would take uh, between 140, 150, 160 swings, a session, which in a group of three, it's gonna take just a little over an hour, about an hour and 10 minutes. If you have a group of two, it'll be a little bit less. Um, at night, or when they would go hit on their own, part of the program was they were supposed to use the weighted bat 50% of the time. At first, we didn't know how they were monitoring and tracking that, but here's the thing that we saw with this type of program, it creates a culture, it creates a buy-in, it creates a mindset, it creates this physical mindset where guys want to compete, they want to get after it, and they held themselves accountable to do it. Okay, so every time we went in and hit with them or went and checked on it, they were doing it. So think of that in itself. The program and the idea of the physicality of being physical with the ball was creating some sort of culture of something for guys to latch on to. Okay, so what would happen? Our freshmen in the junior college, um, in this span, in their first off season of the program, showed a 12 mile an hour increase in exit speed. The sophomores, after going through the program twice, their second time going through it, showed an increase of around 18 miles an hour. Now, that is significant. It is life changing for some kids. That is super dramatic way to say it, but when you take a kid, a high school kid who can impact the ball, at 85 or 86 mile an hour tops in front toss, you put them on this program and they can start hitting the ball over 100 miles an hour, they just went 
from a Division III player with no scholarship money, paying all kinds of money, to a Division I player who is now going to get a 60% scholarship, and it sets up the rest of their life with their education. So it is not that dramatic. It is a big deal. Okay, and it, that's what happened. Our list of guys who could hit the ball over 100 miles an hour in training, if you went down the list, I can pick out maybe two or three who then did not have success in the game. I will show you the high school numbers that translate to that. Of course, it is not the only answer. There's multitude of factors to that. Weight room, experience, just becoming a smarter hitter. There's all kinds of things. Pitch recognition, swinging at good pitches. Multitude of factors, but the weighted bat program, without a doubt, played a, played a piece of the puzzle, okay? In the program, and I'll show it to you again real uh, after this, but in the program, in the eight weeks, the first five weeks, the players swung 80% of their swings with the weighted bats. In weeks six through eight, they swung the weighted bats 50% of the time. To me, that is the most important part of the program, okay? I will show you the list, and it'll have drills explained. Drill one, drill two, rear hip resistance drill, vertimax drill, all these different drills. I don't think that that's what mattered, okay? I think it plays a part because it could help them define some movements. It could have some guidelines to what movements should be to create speed, but I don't think that was it. I think it was the amount that they used the weighted bats. That was the most important factor. Um, and I want to, again, I, I keep saying this, I like to, I, it always seems like I have to apologize that I love weighted bats and that I love bat speed because people freak out over that. It's like, oh, but there's so many other things. Yeah, I know, that's why, and I'm explaining it that way. But I want to make it very clear that the weighted bats themselves are not a new thing. Guys have been using them for decades and years. Cavemen picked up, I don't know, trees and hit rocks. Like, it's not a new thing, right? I want to make that extremely clear. I, we're not trying to reinvent anything. Again, what we did is come up with some sort of systematic way to use it. Um, okay, so this was the results, again, because it doesn't matter what you're doing in the training if it doesn't lead to on-field success. Okay, so what we saw in this four-year period the guys that could hit the ball over 100 miles an hour in the training, those were their stats. 530 slug, 447 on base, you see the average extra base hits. The guys who their top exit velocity was 95 to 99 in the training, still pretty decent numbers. Those numbers will take, they're gonna play for us. When you get down to the lower ends, and that's all that their body could create, was top exit velos of 90 to 94, they could not stay on the field for us, okay? Was there a multitude of factors? Yes, of course. But that was one of the correlations with the exit velocity in the training to on the field. It was just, it happened all the time like this. And I can point out all the high schools that do this, do the, you'll see the exact same correlations, okay? And also while we're, we did this, I'm explaining this a lot in junior college and high school settings, our professional minor leaguers have done the program. Two of the guys who were the most committed to it last off season, who actually followed the percentages the most, because it's hard to monitor them when they're on their own. One of them, his average exit velocity in season last year increased 4.2 miles per hour. Like in season, that's crazy. It's the difference. It's one of his biggest difference. He had a ton of contact skill, but he didn't impact the ball very well. Did some of the movement changes helped, yes, but he didn't change that much. What changed was his mindset, his intent. The weighted bats created a different mindset for him to be physical with the baseball and it created speed for him. Another player who was a switch hitter from the right side made the, about the same, it was like 4.5 or 4.6 miles per hour in one season. Again, there's other factors because they played a short season, they went to a full season, they had more experience. These guys could already make contact but the idea of creating speed helped them impact the ball harder. Okay, if you just make contact and don't impact the ball, I don't know how valuable that is in the long run. Okay, and then just Major League Baseball data just to prove or to build on to the point, and this doesn't take into account like the angles they hit the ball at all, 
All this does is take into account how hard they're hitting the ball. This is in-game data. One of the biggest differences between you guys, youth level, high school, junior college, we didn't have a way to monitor this in the games. Obviously, at the professional level, you do. The harder you hit the ball, you'll see where the slugging is, where the extra base hits are, the, the 100 mile an hour range and over, you're gonna see a ton of extra base hits. As you keep going down that, you'll see the batting average just keep getting lower and lower and lower and lower, okay? Now you wanna play into the attack angle part of it. Now here's, here's one of the kickers with that, and I didn't put an image of it, but if you hit a line drive at 10 to 14 miles an hour, or excuse me, 10 to 14 degrees, which is a good line drive, it doesn't matter any of that. Like if you just hit the ball at a good angle, your batting average is crazy, like well over 700. Okay, so it doesn't even matter that. Okay, but if you don't hit it at that perfect angle, you're probably gonna get out, okay, if you, you're not impacting the ball hard. Um, and the mechanics of my presentation, again, my presentation style sucks, so I had to switch over to this because I didn't know how to put this in my PowerPoint. Here is an example of the program itself. Okay, so eight week program, you can see at the top, we have a med ball series, they go through all that stuff. But at the top it'll explain 80% of the swings with the overweight bat, minimum plus three ounces. Okay, and then for every day, there's day one, day two, and day three of that week. The guys that come in to do this, to implement this on your own, it's an off season program. That's where I kind of want to open up the questions because this is, to me, one of the things in high school that happens is there are challenges. You have multi-sport athletes. You have guys who aren't, baseball itself is not the only passion in their life. They have other interests. High school baseball presents a challenge of getting guys to be committed to this. The guys that come into our facility in Iowa, they have to come twice a week and the third day we want them to come but if we understand conflict of schedule. They are not required to the third day. But they are, cannot participate in the program if they don't come twice a week. If they, even they, in the eight week period, if they come once, we kick them out of the program. You have to be committed to it. And again, that's a mindset and the, the culture you're trying to create with it. Um, as you go down the list here, you can see there's a multitude of drills. Okay, drill one, drill two, poker chip drill, the leg kick and regular blend, drill, blending all of them. Again, I think whatever you believe in your program, whatever drills you believe in, I think you can do it your own way. Okay, I could explain those drills in side conversations like if you really wanted me to. I don't think that that was the most important part of it though. And as you go down, after we get to week three, you see there's a velo test on day three. There's velo testing every single week. Okay, and with that, now you start introducing things into it because again, it's not like we're just on the tee and front toss and just swinging the heck out of the bat like a maniac, okay? There's timing windows and timing elements thrown into it. And <clears throat> you'll see simulated velo as we get to week four, simulated velo on day one. The rest of the week, we're gonna do some type of simulated velo where we change the distance as we throw the ball, that type of thing, or go to a machine, change the speed on the machines. Okay, so we want to introduce the speed into timing windows. What would happen a lot in this eight week period, it is also not a linear progression. It just isn't keep going, everything just gets better week after week after week, and it's just all rainbows and puppies. Like there are some frustrations and difficult times in that. What can happen in between like week three and four, you might see a little bit of dip down in exit velocity. All of a sudden back in week six, six and seven and eight, it starts shooting back up. Okay, and then you even, you'll see around week four, the targeted launch angle, okay, we have a hit tracks. So we have all this fancy stuff at our facility to monitor that. High school youth baseball, you don't have those things, but maybe pick out a target on the cage, tell them to hit the ball at the target at a good angle. Okay, it isn't about hitting homers. It's about hitting the ball hard at good angles. Okay, so having it, when you're trying to introduce that speed, now make sure it's done at the right angle so it's not just pounded into the ground. Okay, and, the, and it goes on and on and on for 
the eight week thing. Um, okay, here, here are some of the results. And I just took a, a group from the end of the 2017 season. Uh, the initial testing, you can see the initial testing. We just tested max velo, average velo, and then we took their ground ball percentage back to the lowest hanging fruit. Why were we doing that? A lot of the guys on these teams, their coaches were complaining that they hit the ball on the ground too much. They don't score enough runs. So we're like, okay, let's track it. Let's try to find if we can hit more line drives through the course of it. But it wasn't just tracking the line drives because maybe our line drive percentage increases 12%, but our ground ball rate stays the same. We didn't want that. Also in front toss, there probably shouldn't be a ton of ground balls. Okay, unless you're working on some feel and doing it on purpose. Okay, back to the feel versus real. Sometimes there's value in that. Okay, but we wanted to monitor that as well. And as you can see, the increase, okay, and after the eight week testing, the increase, the average exit velocity went up 8.8 .8 miles per hour and the amount of ground balls went down uh, 8%. These are high school kids. Okay, so let's take a couple for example. So, <clears throat> Uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you a couple for his, so this Josh Ball kid, he first came in, his average exit velo was 73 miles an hour. By the time he got done with the eight week program, it was 85.6. This kid was a senior, his junior year, he played JV baseball. His senior year, he became a starter. He hit over 300 for his high school team at the 4A level. There's four levels in Iowa. He ended up being a starter on a 4A baseball team. I do not want to make it sound like that's the only thing. There's probably some things with confidence, things with the strength room, or the, the weight room, excuse me. There's other factors to it, trust me. But if he didn't do this, I, I, I honestly think it was a, if there was a piece of the puzzle in the holistic view, I think it was a pretty big chunk. Creating speed and be able to do more with the baseball gave him a chance to play. And I could go down the list and give you more examples like that. Um, okay, so here's an example of a group of guys. They went through the program. They went through the eight-week program in November, December. They came back. They wanted to keep hitting. So they hit from January to May. Iowa high school baseball plays baseball in the summer. And I think part of that has to do with weather. They play a 40-game schedule, that type of thing. Um, they wanted to hit up to the season, and I think only two or three of these guys were multi-sport athletes, so they, they didn't have anything else to do. Okay, so what we did with them is we took their in initial testing again after they went through the eight-week program in December, in November, December. They came back in January and kept hitting, and they kept getting retested. We have other trainers at the, at the facility. Clearly, I wasn't, I wasn't there for the, once I got into the February sessions. But when we got to the testing of what we were doing now, is we were taking the max ex velo, the average ex velo, we were taking the percentage at launch angles between five and 30 degrees. How many balls do they hit between five and 30 degrees? That's a really wide range, okay? But, and I'll show you a high school that uses a, a chart. They don't have anything to monitor on their field. They call it three to eight to be great. And I'll explain that to you. But you take an example, like at the initial testing, some of the guys' percentage of good angles between five and 30 degrees, you'd see 57%, 66%, 36%. This kid, Harrison, initial testing in January, 36% at the end, he got it up to 65%, okay? If you're not in front toss, maintaining angles between five and 30 degrees at a 70% clip or higher, you're probably gonna have a hard time maintaining angles in games. That's kind of what we found. That being said, um, the other point of the angles is we feel like that was part of the thing that the weighted bats was creating as well. Now, we were giving them objective outcomes of where to hit the ball, but it was cleaning up some path issues. It was, they were moving faster and it was allowing their path to be better as opposed to shutting their body down and now trying to manipulate things in their swing to 
tell the bat where their eyes are telling them where to go and creating really funky angles. When they're moving faster and we're just freed up and figured out the timing and tempo element of that off of a pitcher and they were allowed to move fast, they were swinging at better angles and they're hitting the ball harder. You can see the increases here. This was after they did all the testing. Again, they made another six mile an hour jump. Okay, and then typically guys take a couple months off after the season that, it's gonna go down at initial testing, so some, sometimes that can be a tricky thing, but we like to see it from the time they're a freshman to a junior, you'll see some of those numbers maintain themselves. Okay. Okay, so we explained a lot of the program. I can show you on your own, like just showing that itself can be kind of tricky. Again, I think what's important with that is the percentage you use the weighted bats. It is something you can create in the off season. In the high school examples, I'll show you examples that you can use it in season. Um, so the ideas behind it, okay, what started me on the track of that, the, the very first thing that started me on the track of that in 2011, 2012, started reading stuff about the way people learn and memorize things. The Bernstein principle was the very first thing that ever caught my eye of like, okay, how could we do that in baseball? Or okay, some of the stuff I'm doing is really stupid and doesn't really work. It kind of opened my eyes. The idea behind the Bernstein pr principle is the body will organize itself based upon the ultimate goal of the activity, okay? What does that mean? Now, how does that relate to weighted bats? Well, I was taking a lot of guys on the tee and trying to change movements and doing all this, talking to them side by side and saying, do this with your elbow, do this with your hip, and talk, 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 and just verbally assassinating them. And then they get into the game, and they were not doing what I wanted them to do, and I'd be mad at Jimmy, like, damn kid, doesn't listen. But that wasn't the truth at all, okay? We shifted our focus in the, okay, wait a second, I want him to change that movement. I'm gonna explain to him how to do that, but now I want you to hit the ball four out of five at this rope that we set up in the, in the cage at a 15 degree angle. Okay, and I was a junior college coach with a low budget. I had to set up ropes in the cage, set up hula hoops for them to hit it through, things like that. I didn't have a fancy hit tracks to monitor all that stuff. Okay, so we would tell him to do those things and then all of a sudden, it started transferring to the game. You watch the video in the game, you'd see some better movements, okay? The things you were actually working on, okay? So that's the idea behind that. And then it opened up my eyes to a whole new world of how to train some of this stuff. Variability, providing variability is a very important key aspect in motor learning, like how people learn motor skills, okay? That variability, it can have good movements emerge, okay? If I'm providing variability with the weighted back, with a regular bat, you're mixing those up in the rounds, that type of thing. There are uh, opportunities for a player to explore movements and feel things that they might not if they're only just using a regular bat. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff like what your brain, I'm not a brain expert, like to me, like all this talk now of like artificial intelligence is super cool, I think it's really cool, but you wanna know what's more cool? Human intelligence. Like human intelligence is way more cool than that. The brain is the most fascinating thing in the world, okay? So why I'm saying that, I'm not an expert on a lot of it, but a lot of the stuff that I've read, and I just trust the people that are really smart that come up with this research, like the brain wants chaos, it wants some variety, it wants to solve a problem. How are you creating your practice or a situation of hitting a pitch, how are you creating a problem for them to solve that task? When you put a weighted bat in their hand, I think your brain is pretty excited about that. Okay, and then you get into, this is further down the road, constraints-led approach. It's a theoretical framework in motor learning, okay, and what the constraints-led approach is ultimately telling is you can put a constraint on three things, a task, the environment, or the organism, the organism being the player, the player or the performer, okay? In hitting in general, task constraints are the easiest and maybe the most important to manipulate. A task constraint can be 
changing the implement, a weighted bat, a PVC pipe, a light bat, a regular bat, changing the ball, changing the rules of the game, where I can hit the ball, changing all, those are the types of things that you can manipulate in the task of hitting a baseball. Um, the other part of it that plays into it, your body's awareness in space, proprioception, using the weighted bat, changing the grip on the bat, changing the lengths of the bat, it changes how your body is feeling itself move in space. Okay, so these are all the rhymes and reason. There is a lot of research done behind why we use the weighted bat. Not only the on-field results, but there's a rhyme and reason to the whole thing. Okay, so I wanna open that up then. So we just explained quite a few things there, kind of why and how of using the weighted bats. Um, gave you the program itself in a brief glimpse. It's more complicated than that when you, sit, when you sit down and look at it probably. What, if you could sit at your table and just take two or three minutes, what would be some challenges in implementing a weighted bat program in a youth or high school setting? Like what would the challenges be? What would parents say? What would the time conflicts be with other sports, with other activities? If you can in your group, just talk about that for two or three minutes. What's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you wanna just do it? Okay. <laughs> Got to do Kata's camp whistle, <laughs> something like that. There we go. Um, okay, and the reason I say that because I understand that. I coach high school baseball, okay? I coached at levels like that. I understand that there are some challenges, okay? So if we start, start at the back table, would we come up with maybe some challenges trying to do something like this? Uh, we were talking uh, just time, when to do it with your kids, and then buy-in. Um, I think getting over the challenge of buying in, I think if you show the kids the data behind it, kids really like numbers. Yeah. And I think that would be a, a huge a selling point to the program. So I think there, there's a really good point. Okay, so you wanted to do something like this. The first, first thing, you're trying to create the buy-in. Clearly there is information of why hitting the ball harder is important. There's information of high school teams that have done the program and shown increases in it. In the games, they score more runs, which is the name of the game, right? So there is ways to show them information. The second thing, the time, I think it's really interesting and challenging. Okay, and I'm gonna give you a couple examples of maybe some ways to do that where like your players can even lead it. And to me, that's one of the most beautiful things of the weighted bats or providing things of like just, let's hit balls at targets in high school baseball and I don't have a ton of time to sit there and break down mechanics. Weighted bats are one of the best things that you can do because of the time constraint. You can just start implementing them and you can see these little baby improvements. Facility. Facility, yeah. Uh, time. Um, the, the buy-in, like he said, that might be the easiest part. Yeah. Because our, our guys think weights equate 
power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so time we get at, from recreation, when they get out of school, they have to eat homework and then come see us. Right. We get about four hours, maybe. Right. And like you said, with all the other interests that they got, you know, um, sometimes my baseball players don't think I'm supposed to be calling them into the spring. Like, what? <laughs> winter, what? What? What are right. we doing? Right. Yeah. So to get them to realize, no, we're doing a winter program. Right. You know. Right. And I think at every table, that's probably going to be one of the, <laughs> or facilities for high schools, right? I think it's, it's one of, one of the challenging aspects of it to get it going. And it, to get it going, it can kind of create its own little life itself, but at the beginning it is challenging. Is there any, is there any tables that would have a different answer to any of that? For us guys, like our rec teams, we don't know our teams until, we don't get a roster until spring. So we can't necessarily do much off-season work. So that's kind of April hard. through May is essentially our off season. Yeah. So what about once they come into the program and part of the program is offering, okay, so now you're in our program, we're gonna show you what you could do in the off season on your own for the following season. You know what I'm saying? And I think some of this so at the youth levels, I think one of an important aspect at the youth levels, maybe at that moment, because does it really matter if little Jimmy is hits 94 homers as a 10 year old? Or do you want him to have success moving on into high school? So maybe it's something that once they're in your program, it can be one of the benefits of your program. Like you're in our program, we're gonna give you a weighted bat program that once you leave here, it's something you can do on your own. Yeah, that's a great idea. Anything different than any of that? Oh, did Mark just raise his hand? Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the other thing that's missed is making sure that the coaches that are applying it fully understand how to use it and provide the patience with the players of that support, even if it's off season, if it's a Slack or WhatsApp, to go, because adherence, getting players to do what, once they're brought into it, they're still going to change, they're having to change how they normally do off season or change how you're integrating it in the program early on, any, any change. So the biggest challenge for a coach is recognizing it's not just a player to go, yeah, I'll do it and hope magic happens is putting a support mechanism to support that player to allow them to do it. Great point. And there are resources. Here's the deal. There is all kinds of research on weighted bat. If you don't like, maybe you like part of what I'm saying, but you want to find out more, there is all kinds. Clearly, you Google stuff. Coop Derene, he did studies back in the late 80s, early 90s. Like, there are names out there where you can find all kinds of information on that. You don't like the idea of that big of a percentage, which I think is a big deal, you don't have to. Coupe de Rene would say it goes 33% weighted bat, 33% light bat, 33% regular bat it, when you're implementing it. Okay, so there's all kinds of different, there's really no wrong or right way to do that. So there's, there is a lot of information out there to educate yourself and, and how to use it. Okay, I, I think that's a, uh, my, final, my final point here to wrap things up. But I'm gonna show you some examples of the way high schools do use that. So I wanna have that conversation because there are high schools that do this. Once we started having all the success, like this Swing Faster program became like a little life of its own, created its little life of its own, where a bunch of high schools across the nation started using it. Right now, I think there's 37 total high schools using it. There's 14 Division I programs in college using it. Like, it became this thing, okay? And it, all, it almost became such a, I don't know how to operate it. Like when people want it anymore, I used to like charge money. Now I just give it to them because I don't even know what the hell I'm doing. Like I'm not a secretary, I'm not a businessman. Okay, so that being said, here, here are some examples. And this first school, I wanted to go off track just a, just a tad bit, if you don't mind. But this first school, and I also put the contact information of the coaches with their permission, except for this first school, he would not allow me to give his contact permission. I went to this high school, this coach, Alex Bolk, at Mesa City Newman Catholic, the last two years. He took over the program in 2017, he's won back-to-back -back state titles, okay? The coach before that is one of the most important people, like, in my life. And uh, why, why I'm saying that 
is because as coaches in here, we forget sometimes like how much we can impact players. And I can't even talk about this guy without uh, getting a little emotional. <clears throat> so when I began coaching in 1999, I coached high school baseball, 99 to 2004, I coached baseball with this guy. He took over the program from 1967 to 1998. Newman Catholic went to the state tournament six times. Our head coach retired in 98. This guy, Tony Adams, he took over the program in 99. He became a part of my life when I was in sixth grade. Okay, he, he ran a travel team, an eighth grade travel team. I was a sixth grader. He let me play on it. He became like what I wanted to become. It's pretty cool stuff. I get text messages from players late at night, and sometimes it's so late, you kinda, you're kind of like, God, why is he texting me so late? But you forget how important you are to that player. Like, as coaches in the room, I think that's something to never forget. Like, how much you can impact the kids. Okay, and this, as a young coach from 99 to 2004, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know a single thing about coaching. I'll be honest with you. My biggest value to him was being there on time to mow the frickin' field, to be there at 9.30 a.m. to coach freshmen, to be there at 11 a.m. to coach the JV, then to get the field ready for a varsity game, to throw BP all day, whatever he wanted. That was the only value that I provided for him. You want to know something? It was the most fun I've ever had in my life because I was doing it for him. Okay, and what happened, and I'll just wrap it up, what happened is, from 1999 to 2016, it became the most dominant team in the history of the state of Iowa. And I played a part in that, and it's the most proud thing of my, in my life, in helping this guy and his vision. But I didn't do anything really on the coaching aspect besides throw and hit fungos. I helped him, though, build that, and it's one of the most awesome things that I have ever done in my life. Okay, they went to the state tournament the end of his career, nine state times and nine straight times and won six straight state titles. Like, it's crazy. But go back to the Belichick and the Saban and predictable, sustainable programs and success. That was his vision, that's what he created, and it turned into a monster, okay? I wanted to use that just as an example because I think it goes into deeper into what coaching is as opposed to just this stupid weighted bat. Yeah, it's... It matters, but not as much as it does like the relationship. Okay, so the next team, which happens to be the rival of Newman Catholic, Martinsdale St. Mary's, and I think that's why this head coach, Alex Bull, doesn't let me use his information, because I help out this other team at some degree. Um, okay, but what they've done, okay, so this is a thing that they use, and it plays into the weighted bats. Twice a week during the season, they do an on-field hard-hit competition. Okay, and their competition, they call it three to eight to be great. Okay, so you see down here, obviously the arrows, they have some, they have managers tracking this the whole time. You could use an injured player, you could use an assistant coach, you could use a player in the group. There are ways to monitor this on the field. But you see the angles they hit the ball at, Three through eight to be great, they're trying to avoid the other areas, okay? So keep that image in your mind, and they actually have it calculated then in the game, which is the most important part. And I wanted to try to provide something that you could maybe find of value. Okay, but you see over here, as you go down the list from three through eight, look at the batting averages. The batting averages go from, if you hit it at the three to four range, 335, 831. Okay, and that's a pretty significant amount of balls in play. Now the slugging percentage and the extra base hits from five to eight, you're gonna see that increase, okay? But as you look on that, so you see the batting average, you see where your extra base hits are, they keep track of it, okay? And they are bought into it. They use the weighted bats when they do the hard hit competition twice a week. They have also had every high school player they've had who has hit the ball over a 100 miles an hour in training was a first team all stater. There is a correlation. Like I don't know I don't know how to else to place the emphasis on it. When they have guys who can now that's in the last 4 years, I think that's a number of 9 guys. Okay, so 
high school teams don't have a ton of guys hitting the ball over 100 miles an hour. Okay, but we'll show some of the numbers there too. Okay, this is Waverly Shellrock, another head coach. I put his information on there, you wanna to talk to him. This were his numbers in the training. He took all his players from ninth through 12th grade, went through the program. He set it up uh, in, in February and March. Okay, in February and March is when he set it up. The guys who maybe ran track or played golf, they found ways to do it because it became a thing where they showed their guys were having success, so players bought into it. We go, go to the buy-in part. Okay, but on average, each season, uh, you see the 2017 season, they made 10 mile an hour improvements. As you go to 2018, you see their initial average go up, probably because those freshmen in 2016 became juniors, and you see some of the average go. The seniors leave, you got a new class of incoming freshmen come in, so you see some of the averages go up itself. Uh, I got just two or three more things real fast. Okay, we talked about the time challenges. Okay, this was literally from within the last couple weeks. This program, Johnson High School, it's a 4A school. Johnson High School, it's one of the best programs in the state. This is a plan that they had in the last two weeks that was put up in their gymnasium and it was a senior-led practice. Coaches in Iowa are not allowed to work with their players hitting except for there's a three week period before the practice starts in May 7th. They are, can't touch them all year long. So they came up with ways where they're, they bought into the culture. One of the ways that they bought into the culture, the aggressiveness and the physical mindset with the weighted bats, okay? <clears throat> you can see here at the work blend one, all overload bats, all overload bats. Again, the drills, probably could talk about them if you want. There's a lot of them listed in the Swing Faster program as well. But you see, now overload and underload blend. Like they have this entire thing set out. He said on this day there were 14 kids that showed up, all ranges from freshmen to seniors. Okay, so these are just ideas of how you can implement some of this stuff, the importance or the benefit of implementing weighted bats. Okay, and this was just a practice of his in the season. May 31st, that's towards the end of the season for them. Uh, drag bunting, like, hey, don't, that's important too. They got that. Not just hitting homers. Uh, but you see all through this, you go, you go, through, you go through down the list. Uh, overload, overload, fungo and tennis balls, overload, overload, regular bat, regular bat. I mean, this guy's like so organized, it kind of makes me nervous. Like, I, I don't love it all the time. Like, he makes me nervous because I'm not an organized guy. But this is just another example. Okay, and then to wrap it up. Okay, I only put this on there. You combine the weighted bats. If I was a high school coach, I would combine the weighted bats. We just put a screen out there and we just tell them to hit it directly over the top of the screen. Getting them to figure out how to move to hit the ball on a line drive over the infielders' heads. Okay, we're not promoting hitting the ball 1,000 miles an hour or feet in the air. We want them just to hit good line drives into the outfield grass. Okay, so that go plays into the Bernstein principle. That plays into a lot of motor learning principles. Uh, can you hear that music? Don't mind that. Like, I was just trying to change these Iowa farm boys' lights, like providing a little wrap in there. But what this is, so you'll see in this drill, they're changing the angles of the flip. So this is just underhand flip on the field from multiple angles. And he went from a heavy bat to start to a light bat. Now, the field setup itself for coaches that are interested in practice design, like at the back here, there's a net where we showed that net we want them to aim for. A coach behind that can hit fungos to the infielders. There's a lot of different ways to get fancy. While you're working on hitting, you have a head coach that puts a priority on defense. You're like, hey, I got something where we can do both. Okay, this is just a weighted bat. Obviously, you can see the tape on the end. 
Um, and then he's changed into a fungal bat and he's just gonna hit tennis balls. The idea behind that is getting the barrel behind the ball, the bat path stuff that Jimmy was talking about in movement efficiency. When you hit a tennis ball, if you come in at a bad angle, the spin, it's not gonna go anywhere. If I square it up and get behind it, you'll see good ball flight. You're letting the ball flight tell a story. Okay, and this one is just a weighted bat only, but he's just gonna vary from pitch to pitch. He's just gonna change the angles every single pitch. This player, in particular, the year I got to Iowa, this player on the hit tracks could not get the ball over 84 miles an hour. He was a Division I player because he could feel the heck out of it. After an eight-week program on the way to bat, he got up to 99 miles an hour. He turned into a second-team, all-conference, second baseman. Okay, and then we just go off the machine. We're just providing resistance. The thing he's standing on is a Vertimax. But if you have bands, you have that type of thing, it's another way to combine multiple things. You want to work on the movement? You can work on anything you want. Just put a weighted bat on their hand, and now you're going to kill, what is it? two birds with a stone or whatever. And that's it. Um, thank you, that, I know that, that was kind of a lot. At side sessions, you wanna talk more about the weighted bat program, I think that'd be great. It's difficult to go down the entire rundown. Again, the percentages are important. I thank you for being here. On social media, swing faster, success leaves clues, LVS clues. Follow me, you wanna DM me, ask any questions, don't hesitate, thank you so much. So when you guys saw the itinerary, a great part, as we come tomorrow morning, we're gonna get all the speakers together and as you guys digest all this, have a night to sleep on it, get a chance to ask questions, but Pete, obviously with everything he's doing, he's gotta leave uh, later this evening, head back. He's got another uh, another speaking clinic engagement, and so let's take you know a you know couple minutes here. Where if there's something that you wrote down, and it's kind of grinding, and you want some clarity on, let's take a couple minutes here before we take our break. Um, and obviously, he'll be here a little bit. The sidebar, but I think just for the benefit maybe of the group. So if there's any, does anyone have a question? That there we go. I, yeah, I could. The reason I didn't print it out, I'll be honest, is because I've always hesitated giving it out, um, but I would not mind doing that for this group. I can talk to Matt, and if there's a way through your emails or that type of thing, we could send it. Yeah, so the example with the fungo in there now, in, so we never used an underload bat. In the program in 2013-14, it was all weighted bat. 2015, we implemented the, the light bat. You'll see on the program, it's once a week, and there's like a certain amount of swings. There's never a percentage, and it was never every day. We used it once a week, and there was like four to eight rounds committed to using the underload bat. Yeah, so great question. So for me, I have never been a fan, and I've never found value in providing like the weight on the knob and that type of thing. Again, like I mentioned, there's a lot of research. There's people smarter than me have done this kind of stuff. They could maybe provide you with some information on that that would make sense. But the point is on the end, on the end, because what can happen when it's on the very end of the bat, when I start my movement, when I start my swing and it starts to go down into the slot, if I am lazy with my movements, I'm not good with my turn, I'm not good with my shoulder acceleration in the path, I could lose that thing and dump it pretty easily. And now my plane's really messed up and the imp I'm gonna miss hit the ball a lot of the times if I have any speed to the pitch. So that's the reason for the weight on the very end. For 100% for me, yes. Some of the players I noticed would have, you know, maybe two, three, four, five mile an hour difference. And then some of them, I noticed the one, he had like 12, you know, from beginning of the program to the end. So are there any like baseline characteristics that you see in your experience from 
you know, the dramatic improvement levels versus you know, the ones that are maybe you know, four or five miles an hour? It's a really good question, and I'll be honest with you, I wish I could 100% put my finger on it. I think at some times, though, when you see the ones with dramatic increases, there was maybe some lower hanging fruit, like with their movement uh, solutions to begin with, where they had zero loading pattern. They would load, their hands would go back here, they're not loading in their hip. You clean a little bit of that up with a couple of the drills, provided with the weighted bat, and now you see like these crazy jumps, right? Where maybe also, you could take a guy who came in with already an 86 average for a high school kid, and now his room to grow really isn't as much. For our pro guys, it's harder for them, it's harder to take like one of our first round draft picks and make a 14 mile an hour jump because they already have the speed. You know what I mean? So that's why you, there could be some variations in the numbers too, just depending on the guy. They already have some of the speed built in. The center of the bat doesn't, uh, doesn't eliminate the um, balance issues, mm -hmm. whereas you, you might be changing swing mechanics slightly with the weight always at the end of the bat. Right. If you move the weight down toward the middle, doesn't that promote better balance to the swing, a little less awkward, and still get the benefits of the weight? Yeah, I would say there's two answers to that. Number one, I think it's, I think it's a decent point. Like maybe with some younger kids that you might find value putting in the middle. There's studies that I haven't dug that much into. His name's Perry Husband. Okay, and he's this effective velocity guy. That's his big deal, is training hitters to hit effective velocity. His argument and his research, research has shown that using the weighted bats does play a little bit and play around with the timing of your swing enough to provide value because now it's providing more information for you to figure out how to be on time. So I have the weight on the end. Maybe there is a slight little mechanical change, but guess what my body has to do? It has to move more efficiently to get that barrel where it needs to be to hit the ball hard. Does that make sense? So I haven't done a, dug into the Perry Husband stuff a lot, but he has a weighted bat program itself. But his is more revolved around the timing issues where there might be a tiny little flaw. But what he always sees is that now when he uses the regular bat, like it kind of just cleans itself up because they were, they were encouraged to move fast and get after it and not slow their body down. This is somewhat re related. I work with a lot of 10, 11, 12 year olds that have never played baseball before. They've never swung a bat. And so I don't know if you've come up against ideas for weighted bat work with kids that are just for the first time exposing themselves to all of this. Do you have any thoughts on how long you might want to wait certain things you want to see before you start a program like that? I think it's a, I think it's a great question. I would, say a I would say a couple things. So right away, like take for example, you take that 10 or 11 year old, not a lot of experience with baseball, the very first thing he does is pick up that weighted bat, eh, might not be the greatest idea. Okay, but what if with that kid you start playing around with different implements? Maybe the regular bat at first and you show him like some basics, but promote speed promote swinging fast, hit the ball hard, okay? You want to promote that because again, Greg Rose, the TPI, and I, I'm gonna use people who are way smarter as me as the references, they will tell you the biggest challenge as you get older is trying to create that speed, okay? Now, the other challenge with that, so take a kid, we said three to four ounces. Let's say that 10 or 11 year old, after a couple weeks, you've implemented a couple drills you wanted, what if you only put one or two ounces on the end of the bat, right? But I would also revert back to what I said at the beginning. I have not done this a lot with 10 and 11 year old ages. I'm giving you examples of what I would do if I was put in that situation and also off of the information of someone like the Greg Rose would give me. But that's why I've always kind of waited until seventh and eighth grade. Like I've always just, for me personally, I felt more comfortable with it. I've seen Greg Rose in golf he promotes getting after with the swing, and then what he'll do is maybe have a guy now swing a t He changes the implements in sport. Like, he's teaching golf, but he'll have him now swing a tennis racket as fast as he can. He'll have him swing a, uh, 
I don't even know what other hell, a bat, he'll have him swing bats left and right handed because he just wants them to move fast. The idea, if you're not 100% comfortable with using the weighted bat, still promote speed. Still promote moving your body fast. What about as far as tracking it goes if you don't have uh, access to like a hit tracker? Can you say so, that again? I'm sorry. Uh, what about tracking? Like as far as the tracking goes if you don't have access to a hit tracker great, or something? Great question. Probably should have brought that up. Remember, junior college coach, listen, I didn't have a budget either. Radar gun. Okay, we just used a radar gun. And now I'll give you a couple of things with that. So here's what can happen. So we had a jugs gun. We didn't even have a radar gun that could go behind home plate and monitor the, or record it, right? So we would stand a dip, right down the middle, behind the L screen, behind the tosser. We'd stand right there. We'd go outside the cage and stand like in a line with the shortstop. Here's what can happen, because where are their hardest hit balls going to be? Straight into the ground. So what I would do is I would stand outside the cage on a ladder, and I would go up three or four rings, and I would now change the angle of where they're hitting it. And our testing actually in... 2015, 16 at the junior college became with me standing on a ladder. That's where our testing was because I didn't want them just hitting the ball 109 miles an hour at my feet where again, they're just out faster. Yes, so I'm standing through, I'm, yes, I'm standing here. Yes, promoting the right angle, hit the ball hard at good angles where you're gonna get on base. Does that answer that? <clears throat> comment that we could enter that into our drills we're using now. We don't have to use your specific drills. So we can take a drill we're using now and just go ahead, enter the weighted bat into it and... 100%, 100%, and that, that's what I think is some of the beauty of it. Whatever you have in your teaching a movement style and the drills that you like, do them, but just incorporate a weighted bat. It is really that simple. <clears throat> you, there could be some value in a couple of the drills that I do, but I, I'll be honest with you, like I'm not an overly huge drill guy. Like I like, I like other aspects. Like in this program, I think you have to sometimes, but then promoting like from BP to the machine and try to, we, we try to try to simulate the velocity as best that we can. And in high school, I think it's a little easier than in professional. Um, but yes, and in the drills that you do, just use the weighted bat. Uh, so do you think you can get the same effect with, so I also coach younger guys, usually 12 to 14, so some of them are high school age, but can you get the same effect so in like our league, it's like a drop 10 bat. If I just hmm. give them a high school drop three bat, is that, can you get the same effects as if you put the weight on the end or not because it's distributed still throughout the entirety of the bat? I would say yes. Okay. Nice, all right, let's give uh, Pete another round of applause and then another five minute break, guys. Get up, stretch out, reload, and then uh, we'll keep this going.